allow us to look at the, the strandedness. You can see sometimes genes are just expressed in, on, on, on top strand, sometimes on the bottom strand, but sometimes there are also regions where, to, you know, which are overlapping bottom and the top strands of different genes or, or different functions are expressed. And there were also uh, quite a, a few papers on using this strandedness information, to, for example, this case, uh, to, f to uh, un uh, understand oral squamous uh, cells carcinoma by Brian Tush and what they, for example, figured out that when they compared normal to tumor sample, that here in the tumor sample at the bottom strand, uh, th th there was suddenly something expressed which was not expressed in the normal tissue. So there was a, a gene expression in the tumor sample and also you can see down here there's a lot of expression which does not appear in the normal sample. And you can see again here the overlap and that's why it's so important to have strandedness information between top and bottom strand, if you don't have this information, like on microarrays, for example, you don't have that, you, you, you don't realize that this is a different feature expressed. And also the beauty about next generation sequencing is that you, besides the RNA world, you can also look at the DNA world. Here was actually copy number uh, gain of 9x, and here was a copy number gain of 4x and of 3x, which might also explain why in, a, in, in the tumor sample this was, you know, uh, perhaps different expression states. Um, they also looked at allelic uh, imbalances, so you know if, if there are different alleles with different uh, expression patterns, so they could actually correlate the copy number variation on DNA level with the RNA level, and they have seen this correlation. We heard today that sometimes also people are looking at single cells or starting to try to examine uh, single cells. So what you can do on an, on an RNA level is actually, and it has been uh, shown by. Uh, uh, Azim Zorani's group that you can actually do whole transcriptome analysis starting with RNA from a single cell. So here they actually looked also at the uh, stem cells from the inner cell mouse and they looked at single cell RNA expression and, to, and, and at different time points of these uh, stem cells and embryonic bodies to see what, is, what RNAs are expressed and what are not expressed. So a lot of things can be done. We, we can look at uh, some small RNAs, coding and non-coding small RNAs, uh, and we can look at expression patterns in a very, very similar way as with microRNAs, just with the advantage, also as Schulte has shown here, the higher dynamic range, and also that you can actually see uh, uh, new small RNAs. So with that, I would like to, to, con to, to conclude the, uh, the applications. Um, on the on a solid system, next generation massively parallel sequencing, and I would like to go to this uh, third technology, which is sitting between the Sanger sequencing and, and the next generation, which is called the Behind Torrent uh, platform. And I'm not sure how many of you have seen that, so let me give you a quick introduction what we do. So we're actually doing a sequencing, a semiconductor sequencing. We're sequencing on, on the chip, where all the on the microchip, all the sequencing reaction is done here. The the liquid, the flu, um, the chemistry is going in here, it's coming out here. And this, when we do a, a cross section, you can see that the chip has a lot of wells, and in every well we have one sequencing reaction. And the sequencing itself, the reaction itself, is monitored with a pH meter which is just sitting underneath the surface. So it's a very scalable uh, platform because we can just increase the chip size like every computer manufacturer, just increasing the number of transistors. We can, you know, in principle, increase the number of wells we have on the chip very scalable, it's very, very simple, and it's very, very fast. Uh, the way we sequence is we just use polymerase sequencing, so we have a DNA strand, we need a, a primer, and then we flow individual nucleotides across our chip. So the ATPs, and then we look, is this the ATP incorporated? Then we add the CTP, and if the DCTP, for example, is incorporated, we have a polymerization process, and during the polymerization process, we a hydrogen ion is released. And this hydrogen ion is then detected in the well, because on the each well, we have a pH meter, a little bit of pH meter, and this detects the hydrogen uh, ion. So we're doing the sequencing on the chip. The chip is just going here on, on the instrument. The instrument has four uh, falcon tubes for the DATP, DCTP, GT. GTP and TCTP, a, a few buffers, touch screen to, uh, to steer the instrument and, and the server to analyze the data. At the moment, we launched uh, the system in December, so it's two, two months ago, first instruments came out. Um, <coughs> we call it the 314 chip, has a, a throughput of 10 megabases per run, and with a read length of 100 bases. 
Um, in about three months' time, we will come out with a 316 chip, which has a throughput of about 100 megabases and probably will still be around 100 bases. And towards the end of the year, we will come up with the third generation of the chip, and we just increase the, the, the density, the number of wells, with the 318 chip, and it should, it should give something like one gigabase of throughput. And we also think that we are then at the read length of 200 bases. So you can see that the throughput is completely different to a solid. A solid has 90 gigabases or 180 gigabases per run. Here we are in, in the 100 mega, 10 to 100 megabase region, uh, which is scalable still. So that's then more you know, suited for different applications like targeted resequencing or, or microbial resequencing, viral resequencing, all those kind of things. Um, the workflow is a pretty fast one. I would say you know, we start with DNA, RNA, there's a library preparation, there's an emulsion PCR step, and there's a sequencing and the data analysis and all together I would say you can do in a day. Okay, so which is also a little bit different from next generation sequencing, which is normally taking, you know, as we've seen, perhaps uh, one day up to one week for the, for, to run the sequence. Here, sequencing run is two hours, sample preparation is also much faster. So at the moment, we support small genome sequencing and mitochondrial DNA sequencing with a 10 megabase chip. And targeted resequencing, amplicon sequencing, as we go with the larger chips, we will also go for library assessment for next generation sequencing or barcoding of the, the sample so that you can put more samples on a single chip and because they have a DNA barcode we know in which well is which sample and later then we also talk, uh, think about going to RNA-seq and uh, chip-seq uh, as soon as the number of uh, wells we have on the chip is increasing and makes sense uh, um, from an experimental point of view. Just to give you a few examples of uh, experiments, here is a microbial sample you can, on the E. coli DH10B, our workhorse. Again, you can see here the GC percentage, so it's a variation GC uh, uh, percentage, but even you know, if we have this variation, the coverage is very, very uniform across the different GC contents, so there's no GC bias or things like that. We also have a very nice coverage. If you look at the coverage, x-axis is the coverage, the sequence coverage, uh, the y-axis is the number of reads. So can, it should be a, uh, the green line is the theoretical model, and the red one is, is what is really observed, so we can see a very nice genome coverage um, uh, from the chemistry. This is, these are data which have been presented by Stefan Schuster from Penn State University last week at AGBT. Uh, he he, uh, he showed, for example, some, some data about where he sequenced a very difficult to sequence H. pylori uh, bacteria at the 30x uh, sequence uh, coverage. They achieved 99.9% .9 accuracy over eight or nine more homopolymers. Um, and we can see here on the picture, there is actually uh, some region with five A's and then separate and then the six A's and we can see that they're very nicely uh, resolved um, for, for these things. So they could actually differentiate that uh, very nicely. Also these homopolymer regions and somebody told me that these homopolymer regions are actually also important for from, from a clinical or research point of view that people are looking for, for homopolymers like seven A's to differentiate that from nine A's and things like that. Um, also uh, at AGBT chat uh, Nussbaum has shown some bacterial genome Probably sequencing amplicons. Se Excuse me? Thank you very much. Amplicon sequencing and library assessment. So with that I would like actually like to conclude <coughs> there are different sequencing technologies out for clinical research. Capillary electrophoresis, long reads, not so much, not, not, uh, not such a high throughput, about a megabase per, uh, of data per day for targeted resequencing, bacterial, fungal, and also especially for fragment analysis size, uh, sizing experiments. The Eintorn personal genome machine for targeted resequencing with thousands to millions of moderate reads. Um, and the solid with a very high throughput. And with that, I hope I could give you an overview of sequencing technologies in the next generation sequencing space and also how our customers are applying them to the different fields. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much.